Praise the Lord, Hebron family. We've been studying from the book of Acts. And first, let me also say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers that are here and all the mothers that are watching from the church online. So on this Mother's Day 2021, I'd like to bring you a message from the book of Acts about the story of a young boy who becomes a young man and then an old man and his mother that is seen in the book of Acts chapter 12. We are familiar with Acts chapter 12. We've actually moved on from chapter 12 to chapter 13. But if you would go back with me to Acts chapter 12, verse 12, and look at that with me together, we see that Acts chapter 12 starts off with Peter and his miraculous escape from prison. We see King Herod says that he's going to start persecuting the disciples, and one of the sons of thunder, the sons of Zebedee, James, is executed by the sword. And now Peter is also seized, and he is put into heavy prison guard with round about every six hours, four guards guarding him. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and shined a light in the cell, and Peter uh, without knowing what was going on, was taken out from one layer on to another and to the streets. And then he goes, and uh, when he comes to his senses, he goes to a particular house, verse 12. When, he had dawned, when, it, when this had dawned on him that he was indeed a free man, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. So today we will be studying the, uh, about this particular person, named John Mark. This is not just from one particular portion, but throughout the New Testament, we can learn about John Mark. He appears in the New Testament both overtly and also covertly, where uh, Bible scholars say that it was really Mark that was mentioned in different portions. I know that there are many Bible historians here, so this is what I've learned uh, from studying, so please forgive me if there's any mistakes. So let us learn about this young man who, despite many of his shortcomings, was able to positively influence the church for many, many decades, or four, four decades, and became the one who took the gospel to Alexandria in Egypt in North Africa. He was born into a rich family with a lot of wealth. He could have easily chosen the easy life, like many of the young people living in in our church, and in America. He lived during a critical time, and during this critical period in the early church, he was able to interact with many of the characters in the Bible, including Simon Peter, the Apostle Paul, and many of the other disciples, as his mother was a devout believer and opened up her home that was a big home because they were rich. And uh, we see that their home was always open for prayer and fellowship for the followers of the way, the first century church. The mother would push him along, along with his cousin Barnabas, and initially he had a failure to launch into ministry, and he came home depressed and defeated, but he did not end there. His life story does not end there. He had all the right to be a casual Christian, but he let all of that go, as Pastor John Verghese was just saying. He was crucified with Christ to suffer for Christ and paid the ultimate price and was an ultimate martyr, dragged and killed by a horse in Alexandria. So let me tell you the story from the beginning. Once upon a time, there was a young man in the northern African town of Cyrene, which is modern-day Libya. And he was a Jewish man. Uh, he, no, sorry, he was a Greek man, and his name was Aristobulus. He married a Jewish woman um, who was of the tribe of Levi, and her name was Miriam, which also means Mary. And they were living in this North African town of Cyrene, and the uh, people that are native to that place kept attacking them over and over, and uh, uh, they didn't like the Roman occupation. So uh, what Aristobulus and Mary decided to do was to move to her hometown, which is near Jerusalem. People say it was between Cana of Galilee and Jerusalem. 
And it was there that Simon Peter, uh, sorry, Simon, we, we know about uh, people from Cyrene, like Simon who carried the cross, and also his son Rufus, and that's in North Africa. But they moved from there to Israel. We believe that Mark was a young boy who was actually born in Africa, in North Africa, but then he went as a toddler to Israel. And then we see the first glimpse in an occult way, in a hidden way, that's only seen in the book of Mark about this uh, person named Mark. Uh, and that's in Mark chapter 14, verse 50 to 52, if you would put that up. We know that, uh, that Jesus had his last supper. And uh, we know that this young man who had seen all of this happening followed uh, Jesus and his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. And it talks about a young man who just had a linen cloth about his body. And the, uh, the Roman soldiers or the Jewish uh, soldiers uh, started to seize him. And he ran away naked, it says. And the Bible scholars say that because it's only in Mark and because it seems to be a narrative that is not in the other Gospels, that it is a, a, an autobiography of sorts of Mark saying that I was there. I was this young boy that saw uh, the, the uh, kiss of Judas to betray Jesus. I was there to see uh, how... Peter cut off the ear of Malchus and uh, how Jesus responded to that. I was there to see the betrayal. I was there uh, and the soldiers grabbed me and I had to run away. So we see a, a little bit of a glimpse into the life of Mark and how he had uh, been there. And then later we see that uh, the house of, Mar of Mary, really, Aristobulus, after they moved uh, to Israel, soon died. And uh, he, uh, we see that Mary uh, might have been a widow. And uh, this bo young boy, Mark, was living in that house. And she became a follower of the way. And all the disciples, one after another, were uh, in the house. And uh, we see that Peter, after he was, after he was uh, deserted, uh, or after he was uh, uh, almost executed, and he got out of the jail, he came to this house which is the house of Mary, as it says in Acts chapter 12, verse 12. And we also learn about Paul, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Paul and Barnabas and how they had a sharp disagreement later. But before that, on the first missionary journey, we see that Mark was taken along. We studied that the church in Antioch was the, the, the first church where they were called Christians, and, and there was a famine going on in Jerusalem and we learned that Saul and Barnabas was sent with money from Antioch to Jerusalem. And, and in chapter 13, verse 1, it says that Mark came along with his cousin Barnabas. Uh, people wonder if he was his cousin or his uncle. But either way, he was a relative. And Barnabas decided to take this young man, uh, Mark, along with him on the journey back to Antioch. And soon after, in chapter 13, we see that Paul and Barnabas were anointed to, uh, and, and set apart for the ministry. So when they went on their first missionary journey, Barnabas took his cousin, Mark, along, and they went to Cyprus. It might have been a rickety boat that they were on, and they went to Cyprus, and we saw that they go to Pamphylia, and we see that they uh, go to the towns that Joe mentioned last week uh, with uh, uh, the um, Bar Jesus and all the miracles uh, that took place there. But lo and behold, I think what young people call it these days is something called ghosting. They ghosted. What happened with Mark was that he ghosted Paul and Barnabas. He basically left them. Without telling anybody in the middle of the night, Mark just got up and left. He deserted the first missionary trip, and he went back to Jerusalem. We don't know exactly. The Bible doesn't tell us why he deserted the, uh, the mission. He might have been still an immature Christian. Um, he was maybe missing his mom, and that's why he went back to Jerusalem where his mother uh, was. But whatever the reason, he uh, got up one day and ghosted Paul and Barnabas and uh, went back to uh, Jerusalem. And, and uh, the Bible history says that when he went back to Jerusalem, he was 
uh, people knew that he had gone with them, so he was pretty depressed. He was uh, upset that he had let them uh, down. And uh, Peter kept coming in, and Peter daily uh, might have met with him and told him the stories of uh, what happened as he was uh, living as a disciple with Christ for the, uh, for the many years. And those stories will become useful one day as the first gospel that is written in the New Testament uh, out, of the, out of the Gospels is the book of Mark. And it is really all the stories of Peter, Bible scholars say, that was put together. But he was in a, in, a, in a sad situation, a depressed situation. And we see that Peter poured into his life. And Peter kept telling him about the way that he had done messed up in the past. How he had denied Jesus and how Jesus still found him on the day of Pentecost. And how he was useful for the kingdom of God. And he continued to encourage him. And we see on the second missionary journey, he was maybe a little bit more mature. But Barnabas insisted that they take along Mark. And Paul had a sharp disagreement. Said, no, he deserted us in the past. There's no way we're taking him. And in fact, that caused so much of a conflict that, Peter, uh, that we see that Paul went with Silas. And we see that Barnabas took along uh, Mark, John Mark. And took him to that same places that he would have gone in that first trip and encouraged the church. We, if you study further, um, you'll see that even though there was a sharp disagreement, we'll see in Philemon and we'll also see in Philemon or you'll also see it in uh, uh, Colossians how Mark and Paul had made up and he became a useful vessel and it says that he is useful for my ministry. So even though they had a disagreement, he became useful at the end of his life, not only to Paul, but also to Peter. And it says that uh, Peter became like a father figure because at the end of 1 Peter chapter 5, it says, what does it say? That Mark, my son. So he became a spiritual father to Mark. Even though his father had died, Peter poured into his life and he became a spiritual father to Mark, and we see that he became a useful vessel. So um, Mark had to go through quite a bit of transformation. He became a young man that saw the, the death of Jesus. He was, uh, had bird's eye view to the first century church. He tried to go at a very young age, maybe in his 20s, uh, on his first missionary journey, but he deserted them. And then he was able to go on the second missionary journey. And we know that he is the same man who writes the book of Mark, which became the standard uh, as the first book. And we see that Matthew and Luke might have model, uh, modeled their uh, books after him by the help of the Holy Spirit. Legend also has it that after about 20 years uh, after the Lord is Lord's ascension, that he went as a missionary, giving up his all like Pastor was talking about. He crucified himself and he gave up everything, all the riches, all the wealth that he had back in Jerusalem. And he moved uh, as a missionary to Alexandria, uh, the town that existed uh, many uh, hundreds of uh, centuries ago with Alexander the Great. And uh, that town, he became the leader of the church, the first church in North Africa. And he, uh, many years later, ar around the age of 60-something, he was, uh, because a lot of people were coming to the Lord, uh, and the people of the land were worried about uh, their idols and, and their worship, we see that he was dragged upon a horse. He was uh, pulled on a horse, and his body hit all the rickety places, and it bled. And then they put him someplace at night, the, after dragging him that first day. And then the second morning when they came back, he said, I saw my Lord Jesus speaking to me to stay strong. And we see that on the second day, they continued to drag him. And that is how he was martyred finally in Alexandria. So why am I telling you this story and bringing together uh, the portions from Mark, Acts, Colossians, 2 Timothy, 1 Peter, and Philemon? There is many lessons to be learned from this, and I'll uh, go quickly here. 
Our past mistakes don't have to define our future. You know, God constantly works within us to make us more like him. As we are young Christians, we might not be able to handle the same kind of rigors that Saul and Barnabas had to take on. And he was able to learn from that. That mistake could have defined him. And he went home and he was depressed. But he had a praying mother. He had a mother uh, who had a, a particular direction that he should be a missionary. And then uh, even though she might have pushed him and told Barnabas to take him along, and that led to his defeat, uh, mom continued to pray for him, I believe, and uh, continued to give direction in his life. And he became uh, a great man of God that wrote the book of Mark uh, and that became a missionary to Alexandria. So your past mistakes don't have to define your future. If you've missed up, messed up in your life or if you've messed up in your ministry and you can feel like you can never go back to church, you can never go back or get back on track, you know, uh, over this pandemic, I've, dr I've gone far away from the Lord. And uh, this is not the time to come back. But the Lord is saying that if Mark is any lesson to us, that even if you desert the ministry, sometimes uh, God works on us and continues to work on us to fulfill his plans to make us be useful. We have to be patient. We have to get back to the Lord and uh, stay close to him. Next slide, please. We can also learn a couple of other lessons. It's never too late to reconnect with someone that you've let down. We've all made mistakes in our past. Uh, we all have had conflict with others in our past. And we can choose to ignore it or we could choose to reconcile. And we see that Paul, even though he had a sharp disagreement, even though he was the cousin brother of Barnabas, who was the one that stood up for Paul, and, and uh, stood up to the uh, Jewish uh, disciples uh, and to uh, the disciples of Jesus, it was, ne it, it was um, time to forgive, and then he was useful, it says at the very end, for the life of Paul and for his ministry. It's never too late to forgive someone who you have let down. You know, as we go through life, there is many times that we think uh, we could have done better, or it was an inadvertent thing, or it might have been a mistake that we made uh, in our young, foolish self. And if that is the case, it's never too late to, uh, to ask for forgiveness and also to forgive others who might have and should have known better that uh, might have done us wrong. And that is a lesson that we can learn from the story of John Mark. On this Mother's Day, I'll also like to bring another point that mothers keep praying for your children. Mary led by example and molded the character of her son. We see that Mary uh, was a praying woman. She was a woman that would open up her home for the disciples. And not only that, she had a vision for her son's future. And even though it might not have been in her time, it was in God's perfect timing. And everything that went wrong, the Lord worked together for his good. And because of that, we see two missionary teams going out and the gospel being spread in a bigger way. And because of her desire and her prayer and uh, her getting other mentors, uh, godly men, to speak into the life of Mar John Mark, we see that she was willing to let Peter come and speak to him daily and get him out of his funk or his depression. We see that Mother Mary here, the mother of John Mark, led by example and molded the character of her son. We also see Barnabas, or his name is Joseph, but because he is the son of encouragement, people called him Barnabas. He was a cousin of Mark and Peter, who poured into the life of John Mark as a particular uh, son-father relationship with Peter, and as a cousin who would pour into the life of uh, Barnab uh, Barnabas, would pour into the life of John Mark, and we see that uh, Barnabas was willing to fight with the Apostle Paul so that he would have uh, a good future, that Mark would have a good future. 
He believed in him. I, be, I pray that there will be mothers, there will be people like Peter and Barnabas that believe in the young people, that believe that there is a future for them, even if they've done messed up in the past, that God has a future for them. And it is not about behavior modification. It is about the Lord working in their heart that there would be a change, that you continue to lead by example, and that you would pray, and you would pray, and you would lead, and you would mold them. And that's what we learned from this. But what are the questions remaining for you? Each and every one of us sitting here, you know, the Bible doesn't clearly say this, but people wonder if John Mark was really that rich young ruler. We see that portion in both uh, Matthew, Mark, and the book of Luke, um, that he came to Jesus at a very young age, maybe as a teenager. As Jesus was dealing with the children, that portion comes up in Mark chapter 10. And a young man came and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And uh, uh, the Lord says, keep the commandments. And, and he says, I've been doing that since a young age. And here I think the Lord was showing that the law, keeping the rules or keeping the law is not enough. That there needs to be a heart transformation that needs to take place. The Lord said, you go sell everything and uh, come follow me. And this young man at that point was not willing to do that. And he went away because he was a rich man. He was, uh, uh, we don't know exactly what the situation was uh, with mother being involved and the property and all of those things. Maybe, maybe it was Mark. Maybe it was, wasn't Mark. Maybe it was you and me. We all have excuses to not do what Pastor John Verghese just said. We don't want to be still and submit ourselves before the Lord. We want to be playing church. We want to uh, uh, say we're in church and give Sunday to the Lord, Sunday morning to the Lord, but the rest of our lives we want to live it any which way we want. Do you have that commitment or are we going to walk away like the young rich ruler or are we going to commit? If indeed it was Mark, we see that later in his life he made that commitment he made uh, that commitment to bear that cup of suffering and to be crucified with Christ enough to die as a martyr in Alexandria. So the question I have for you is, are you just a fan of Jesus? Or are you just someone who is coming to church as your parents come to church on Sunday? Or are you truly a wholehearted follower of Christ? John Mark, the evangelist, we see from his life story that even though he had failed once, that did not have to be his end. He became a missionary to Alexandria, and according to the traditions, 19 years after the ascension of Jesus, he traveled to Alexandria, and he is honored as the founder of Christianity in Africa, and in AD 68, for the sake of the gospel, he was willing to be dragged dragged on a horse for two days and the Lord reassured him my son I am with you I am with you I asked the worship team to come up forgot to call you up so uh, as I'm finishing up let me ask you these questions again are we the rich young ruler are we willing to commit ourselves completely are we just a fan or are we a wholehearted devoted follower of Christ. I encourage you to go back and look at the life of Mark and learn from it. And uh, as we go into further portions in the coming weeks from Acts, as we learn about the sermon, the first sermon that's recorded of Paul, and uh, as we learn further, let us commit ourselves to be a wholehearted follower, a wholehearted disciple, someone who was crucified with Christ, as Pastor John Verghese said. May God bless you all.